Today on CityCast Philly, it's the Friday News Roundup. We're talking about how Mayor Sherelle Parker's campaign spent $1 million on payroll. But who got paid? Why home buying might be tricky again this spring. You've got 10 weeks to train for the Broad Street run. Plus, we're going to talk about that horse, of course. It's Friday, February 23rd. I'm Trina Nuri, and here's what Philly's talking about. Ryan Briggs, researcher on the investigations team at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Hey, Ryan. Hey, how you doing? Good. Aaron Moselle, housing and community development reporter at WHYY's Plan Philly. Glad to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me. And Corey Smith, Philly-based running coach, founder of Run Your Personal Best, and a USA track and field certified coach. Welcome to CityCast Philly, Corey. Thank you. Looking forward to speaking today. Yes. Okay. Before we get into the news of the week, let's have some fun with an icebreaker. So in this week's most Philly thing we saw on social media has to be the horse galloping on I-95. Did y'all see this? I guess I saw a video of the horse, but yes. Yeah. (laughs) I I didn't see the horse. I know that years ago there was that zebra that was on Girard. What? Uh, (laughs) Years ago, we're talking like vine days. But I don't remember what happened with the horse. (laughs) Corey, did you see the horse? I did not, actually. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what happened. So according to Philly Voice, this all happened on early Tuesday morning. There's a video circulating on social media of this horse galloping full speed on I-95. And you can see drivers on the highway trying their best to stay clear. Police were able to capture the animal safely And according to Philly Voice, the horse actually belonged to the Fletcher Street Urban Racing Club. Now, in the article, the organization says the horse may have been intentionally released and its stable appears to have been broken into. And shout out to the Philadelphia Inquirer. They somehow, within a couple of days, came out with a video game of the horse on 95. We have a link in our show notes. If you play the game, you have to make the horse jump over cones and grab cups of Wawa coffee. This is so Philly. I I love it. Thank you for promoting our our visuals team's uh, work here. (laughs) But yes, you can play this game. It's called Horse 95. Well, Aaron, you told us one of the most Philly things you've seen on a Philly roadway or highway, which is a zebra. So I have to ask everyone else, what's the weirdest thing you've personally seen happen on a Philly roadway or highway? There used to be a guy who would drive through West Philly who had this like ridiculously like made up car that was covered with like reflectors. But that was just his thing. Like he just had wanted to build this like really flashy vehicle. And it was like top to bottom, like flashing lights and reflectors. And I I always think about that guy. (laughs) I'm sure he couldn't drive that for too long. (laughs) Corey, what about for you? I mean, nothing particularly comes to mind. I mean, in college, we used to make fun of my roommate because he wasn't the best driver. And he once got passed by an Oscar Mayer Wiener car. So that was kind of weird, I guess. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Let's get into some of the top stories of the week. Ryan, you and Anna Orso, reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer, looked into how much money Mayor Sherelle Parker's campaign spent paying staffers on her mayoral campaign last year. And you all found that one million dollars was spent on salaries and benefits. But what you also found was that there's not much transparency on who actually got paid. Right. Yeah, that's right. Um, We rely on sort of like regular reports uh, from different political candidates showing how much money they raised and how much money they spent. Sherelle Parker released those. But for her staff costs, she just reported kind of these like large payments to payroll services. Um, So this would be kind of like if you were showing somebody what you spent on your credit card and you just showed them how much you paid on your statement, Mm -hmm. you wouldn't be able to see sort of individual purchases that you made. So that caught our eye for that story because that's something that in years past you wouldn't really have seen. 
Nowadays, it's a lot easier for anyone, a small business, a political campaign, et cetera, you know, to work with an app or a service to kind of handle payroll like that. And so Sherelle Parker is doing what other political candidates have done, mm-hmm. uh, which is use one of those services. Our issue, I think, was more just, again, on the transparency side, as you said. Uh, we wanted to see, you know, well, who are you paying? Who are your staffers? You know, we don't know. And uh, I think it's important for the public to know what people are advising, you know, a mayoral candidate. And now that Terrell Parker is the mayor, you know, the mayor. How did the campaign respond? The campaign, I think, took the stance that what they did was legal under the letter of the law, which is true. And that they weren't really under any additional burden to provide more transparent records of uh, what they spent. So that they didn't have to do anything else. We asked them to voluntarily release a list of, you know, who the million dollars went to, how much they were paid, what kind of work they were doing. And these might sound like um, big asks for someone who has never looked at like a campaign finance report before, but these are pretty typical things that you see when you pull up that type of uh, documentation. You know, we could see outside consultants that the mayor had hired. We could see individual meals at fast food restaurants that her staffers had paid for and then billed to the campaign. So there's like a level of detail in these reports. But what's missing is, you know, again, that piece of who were her closest staffers. You wouldn't be able to tell who her campaign manager was under the way that, you know, they filed those expenses in this report. And that sounds kind of granular and, you know, it's very detail oriented, but I think our concern was like, well, what if every campaign starts doing it that way? What if they start reporting more expenses that way? Then you're going to have a, syst- a system where campaign finance disclosure rules essentially serve no purpose because everything, you know, could just be reported as an aggregate expense. Here's a, a million dollars that I spent, you know, good luck figuring out what I spent it on. Interesting. But other mayoral candidates did this too, right? Alan Dom and Jeff Brown also reported similar expenses. Um, I think the difference that we sort of drew between what was going on there and what we ultimately reported on was that the amount that they reported was far less than Parker. She had reported more payroll expenses in this way than any recent mayoral campaign that we looked at. So they were reporting, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars versus a million, around a million dollars. They also did not ultimately become the mayor. And we also asked Sherelle Parker to just voluntarily release a list of her staff. And she said no. So that was kind of our feeling about uh, why we wanted to press that a little bit. And I think the ultimate goal is um, not that we're trying to like embarrass Sherelle in particular, say she's the only person that ever did this. It's I think our hope is more that the uh, Board of Ethics will take a serious look at what, you know, is kind of a gray area in campaign finance transparency rules and maybe correct those rules to require campaigns explicitly to have to disclose who they're paying as staffers during political campaigns like this. You can read Ryan's full article by clicking the link in our show notes. More news of the week after the break. This is CityCast Philly. Aaron, spring is less than a month away, and it's also a big season for home buying. I'm not buying a home, though. Um, (laughs) You report that according to the January market report from real estate giant Zillow, it will be tougher than last year to buy a house in Philly. Why? Um, So the main reason is because all of the dynamics that were at play last spring, which was also a very tough spring home buying season, are still in play. So mortgage rates are still high and home values are still high and inventory is still low. And actually, inventory is even lower than it was last spring, um, according to this report, um, by about 10%. So anyone who's looking to buy a house at this point is going to find even fewer options out on the market. So it's just even tighter than it was last year, which is hard to imagine because last year was was awful for anyone looking for a home. Yeah. So are you saying that a part of this too is that would-be sellers are maybe staying put in their Philly homes longer? That's right. That's what's uh, driving the inventory crisis that we have because there are a lot of folks who, um, for example, refinanced during the pandemic, got a great mortgage rate, a lower mortgage rate, maybe, you know, as low as two, three percent. And so um, they're probably not going to be that interested in buying a new house at six or seven percent and and raising their mortgage payments. Um, so they're staying put. 
Um, some of them don't want to. There are folks, you know, who maybe had a second kid and, and need to upgrade and, you know, space is tight, but, you know, just can't afford to, to upgrade at the moment. And so they're, they're staying put. And it doesn't mean that Philly's market is not hot. It's actually the opposite. Homes are selling very quickly. There's a lot of interest in, in buying homes in Philly because of its historic affordability. It's still a place that you can buy a home for a reasonable price compared to other big cities around the country, especially the East Coast. But yeah, uh, there's just not that much to buy. And so um, if you're in the market, it's it's going to be a tough a tough challenge for you to get into something. Now, I'm curious, do you know if if there won't be a lot of options for would be home buyers in Philly? Are they looking to the surrounding counties instead? They may be. But, you know, in some of the data that I've seen about, you know, Montgomery County and other um, collar counties, it's more expensive to buy a basic home. You need to make more money than you do in Philly to, to afford one of those homes. So, I mean, if they got it, great, but there's a lot of people in Philly who don't. And so um, it's sort of a standstill until really those mortgage rates come down. Any sense of when it could be better to buy a house in Philly? Uh, I wish I could tell you that it's going to get better soon, but uh, no one has told me that. The expectation is that these trends will remain in place through the end of this year. Maybe they'll get better next year. The issue that you have is when they do come down, that will release a lot of pent up demand, which will mean the home prices could go up even further. So it's sort of this vicious cycle that we're in right now. And uh, a lot of people are pretty frustrated with that. And it's, it's hard to really give anyone any good news at the moment. Well, we'll be looking for that. Thanks, Aaron. You can read Aaron's full story by clicking the link in our show notes. Corey, we are 10 weeks away from the 2024 Independence Blue Cross Broad Street Run, which is happening on Sunday, May 5th. This is the annual 10-mile race along Broad Street uh, that starts on the Central High School field grounds at Broad Street and Somerville Ave, and it ends at the Navy Yard. Thousands of people all over the city, region, country, world run in this race. Registration for the 2024 lottery is now closed, but there's other ways you can kind of get in if you want to. But there's just as many people cheering and passing out water and Gatorade to runners along the route. I love this event. It's so electric. Corey, how many times have you run this race? It's a good, I can't even count, to be honest, <laughs> to, to be honest with you. Many, many times. I mean, many it times. is... <laughs> It is. I always say it's the it's the best time hour in the country, maybe one of the best races. It really is brings Philly out in full force. Yes. I've done it three times. Congrats. And I just I love how the whole city just like comes together. One year I did not run, but I did volunteer at Broad in Allegheny with my son and daughter's uh, football and cheerleading team, the North Philly Aztecs. We passed out water. It was so great to cheer for the runners. Um, so, Corey, you actually broke down in the Philadelphia magazine how runners can train for this race based on various skill level. You have one for the beginners, the intermediate, and the advanced runners. So for the beginners out there, 10 miles could be intimidating. What should the newbies do to prepare? You know, I think first I say you can do this. Absolutely. I've worked with, you know, people that haven't run a step before and they decided to do Broad Street and they've completed it successfully. So you know, if you're thinking that this is going to be a challenge, um, it will be, but you can absolutely do this. So, you know, for the beginner, I, I guess I would recommend trying to find a training plan, like the one that's in the article that I wrote. And, you know, taking a look at it before you start, and then just, you know, taking a look at the first week or two and being realistic with your expectations and like where you are at the moment, and just making sure that that is something you feel you can do. I love that you say, you know, Make sure that you rest. Take it easy because this is like you're, you got to pace yourself, right? Yeah, totally. So it's, it's you know, you're going to have hard days. Um, you know, the equation for getting better stress plus rest equals growth. So although it can be exciting to kind of get started and you want to do it every single day, it is important to, you know, make sure that you're incorporating some rest days into your training to allow your body to recover. Now, what about runners who have done the race before? How should they approach training? They can be a little bit more aggressive with their training. 
it's always good to have a training plan to follow instead of kind of doing it ad hoc. So again, there is a training plan in there for the more advanced runner, but once you become a more advanced runner, you can start to layer layer in things like speed work, hill work, um, a little bit faster running. All right, let's talk about the professional runners. The more advanced plan is geared towards runners who can run five miles comfortably, as you say. What are some training tips you have for them? It's a good question. So, I, you know, I think the most important tip would be, you know, make sure you have two hard days in there per week. So a hard day is, you know, something that's going to get your heart rate up. Um, typically, we do one hard day during the weekday, then one hard day during the weekend. You know, you definitely want to make sure you're practicing your goal 10 mile pace. Typically, I like to do that on the weekends within a long run. You can read more of Corey's tips in the Philadelphia Magazine. We'll have a link in our show notes. All right, Corey Smith, Philly-based running coach and founder of Run Your Personal Best, Aaron Mozell, housing and community development reporter at WHYY's Plan Philly, and Ryan Briggs, researcher on the investigations team at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Thank you all so much for joining me on CityCast Philly. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. It's time for the tip of the week, where we share a life hack for living in Philly. Speaking of I-95, be mindful of some road closures this weekend. In the upcoming months, PennDOT will be working on the 12-acre park over I-95 at Penn's Landing. You can read more details about this project, which roadways will be closed and detours to take, by checking out our Hey Philly newsletter. If you have a tip of the week, we love to hear from you, too. Call or text us at 215-259-8170. That's all for today here on CityCast Philly. Our executive producer is Laura Benchoff. Our producer is Abby Fritz. Our Hey Philly newsletter editor is Asha Prahar. And our host is me, Trinae Nuri. Music is by Philly's own Interminable with additional music from All the Kimonos and James Weldon. If you enjoyed the show, tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Philly. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Have a great weekend and be safe, y'all. Bye. Bye.